You're listening to episode 252 of My Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn. Today, I'm doing a show on the top five trends I wish that I never got into. And the categories include iron, specifically iron overload, vitamin C, and the topic of whole food vitamin C versus ascorbic acid, EMFs, electromagnetic fields or electromagnetic radiation, EMR, and whether they should be blocked with shielding fabric or shielding paint, cod liver oil, and the issues of polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs in that cod liver oil. And finally, copper. Is everyone copper deficient? And should nobody supplement and zinc? I've noticed, especially the past two years, that these health camps become so dogmatic and so religious about their nutritional beliefs that people pledge allegiance to various gurus and various tribes. And it's almost like the mafia where if someone inside wants to get out, that is essentially a death sentence. They don't allow it. So they have to silence that person by any means necessary. I'm not going to spend too much time on the politics of all of this, but I just wanted to voice that it is absolutely real and it has caused me to take a huge step back from social media which has really benefited my mental and emotional health. I think one of the worst problems in our society today is social media use, and specifically social media use on the smartphone. The social media algorithms encourage conflict because the more engagement you get, the more you'll get bumped up and more people will see your content. And so that causes behavior of people sharing more extreme information, sharing contrarian information, not for the purposes of getting to the truth, but with the intention of getting more clicks with that information. And in the last couple of years, I've seen people get a lot of their health information from these twerking, dancing, real videos. That was really the moment for me when the alarm bells started going off to see that it was more about entertainment and engagement than it was about actually getting truthful information out there. So kicking it off to segue into this episode, I want to say the reason why I got into these subjects that I'm talking about is because of really influential podcast guests that I interviewed in the past and they made really convincing arguments with really convincing scientific studies to back up their point of view. And I really took the information and ran with it. If I get inspired from a podcast guest that I interview, I take the information and I actually apply it to my life to the fullest extent possible to see if it's actually real. And so I did that with the topics that I'm going to talk about. And short term, I seem to experience tremendous benefit. But the thing is, when you make almost any change, you'll feel that you're experiencing a benefit. A lot of people know this with a vegan diet or a raw vegan diet. At first, you feel on top of the world. And that makes you want to scream on the mountaintops that everybody should be vegan or raw vegan because of how you're feeling in that moment. I know because I was there, I wore the t-shirt. But if you take that too far and stay on that path too long, then your teeth fall out. And we saw this time and time again with people in that field having extreme dental issues, not to mention muscular weakness, frailty issues. Common criticism that I receive is you said that you felt so good after blood donation. And I did, but I didn't feel good after the second blood donation. 
and there was a good time period in between them. I didn't do them right in a row. It's a mystery to me why I felt so good after the first blood donation. I felt extremely mentally clear, extremely energetic. That solidified my belief system in all of the things about iron that I'm going to outline in this show that I used to believe. But then when I did my second blood donation, several months later, I think it was more than six months later, I felt extremely fatigued and it was the exact opposite feeling. And to me, that's less of a mystery. That is a clear sign that I depleted my bone marrow stores of iron. And that's why I felt so tired for several months, up to a year really after that experience of blood donation. So for those of you that just started listening to my podcast, just started following my work, then you'll be really confused and this will all sound like extraterrestrial foreign language to you. But for people that have been in the trenches studying human health and nutrition for the last at least two, three years, or have been listening to my podcast for that long, this will all make sense to you and you'll be able to follow along with it. So that's enough prefacing the discussion. Going to jump in here with iron and specifically the topic of iron overload. Now, this is something that I wasn't introduced to on the podcast, contrary to what many people may think. I was introduced to the concept of iron overload very shortly after I started studying human health, which was the beginning of 2010. And one of my teachers or gurus back then would quote verbatim, the entire planet has iron poisoning. And the idea behind that, the supportive reasoning is that acid rain, that is rain that's been acidified more than it normally is because of industrial processes, liberates excess iron from the earth. And that ends up in our water supply, our food supply, and ultimately gets lodged and trapped in the human body and it can't get out. And then I had heard it from a few other educators that I was listening to at the time and started researching it on my own off and on over the years. And then it was the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020, when I really dove in headfirst to this idea of everybody on planet Earth has iron overload and there's no such thing as iron deficiency. And when I take a step back and think about that ridiculous statement, you tell that to a medical doctor and most will probably look at you like you're on hallucinogenic mushrooms. And in my opinion, that's the correct response because it's so ridiculous and it's so extreme and it's so false. The truth is that both Iron deficiency and iron overload exist simultaneously on the same planet. Some people have too much iron and some people have too little. Now, what's really argued about in the natural health space is what percentage of people are iron deficient and what percentage of people are iron overloaded. My response is really who cares? Because what matters is the person that the practitioner is working with in front of them. It's not we're trying to figure out the average percentage on planet Earth. I really think that's a non-issue. And I think that's part of the neuroses of being obsessed with social media and researching to an unhealthy degree is where we get caught up on these percentages. Now I'm going to start breaking down these common arguments that have now gone mainstream. I'm going to start with the easiest one to deconstruct. We only need one to two milligrams of iron from food every day. This is parroted and has been parroted by many 
health practitioners over the last two to three years, over and over and over again, where it's become like a mantra. Now, what's dangerous about this statement is we need to consume 10 to 20 milligrams of iron a day to absorb one to two milligrams from that. If you go and tell someone we only need one to two milligrams of iron from food every day, and you leave out that absorption factor part of the conversation, then you're going to have people walking around trying to get one to two milligrams of iron from food every day, which you'd really have to be a raw vegan, almost a fruitarian to achieve that in actuality. So this might sound like alien language to people that haven't been studying this, but we have this RES system, the reticulo endothelial system, and this is our iron recycling system. And the messaging goes that 25 milligrams of iron is released every day from this system. Therefore, we're getting iron every day and we never need to ingest it. The reality is we need that iron from the RES system, but we also need the one to two milligrams of absorbed iron from our diet every day. It's not just one or the other, it's both. I really like the book by Dr. Carl C. Pfeiffer called Zinc and Other Micronutrients. In that book, it says 90% of dietary iron intake remains unabsorbed, never even entering the blood. Now, people with this iron overload mentality would say, well, where does it go then? It gets stuck in the tissues and stored. No, the reality is unabsorbed iron is managed by enterocytes. Those cells become engorged with iron, they die, they drop off, and are excreted in feces. And then the plot thickens, and the safety system that is built into the human body shows itself even more with this heme versus non-heme subject. Most of the iron that we consume is in the non-heme form. 85 to 90% of it is non-heme, which is tightly regulated by the body's iron stores. And that's what the study from Bothwell et al. 1979 says. It says the absorption of heme iron is only modestly influenced by iron status whereas the absorption of non-heme iron is tightly regulated by iron stores. In English, that means that if the body has too much iron, it's going to absorb even less of it. So whether it's 2% absorption or 20% absorption or anywhere in between, that's determined by your iron status. So it should be a relief to know that the body regulates itself. The average Total dietary iron absorption by men is about 6%, and women in their childbearing years goes up to 13%. And that's Charlton and Bothwell, 1983. So that higher iron absorption by women in their childbearing years, that's due to their lower iron stores to compensate for the losses of iron associated with menstruation. So to tell these women like they've been told that they only need one to two milligrams of iron from food every day is really dangerous advice. When in fact, non-pregnant women need 18 milligrams of iron a day and pregnant women need 27 milligrams of iron a day, at least. One of the people that is referenced often in this subject of iron overload is Robert Crichton. Now, Robert Crichton is a biochemist, and he focuses largely on the biochemistry of iron. So we got the book. It was a couple hundred bucks. It's called Iron Metabolism from Molecular Mechanisms to Clinical Consequences, because I wanted to see the source. I wanted to read it in his words, not what somebody else said that he said. So there's this marker called serum ferritin. So ferritin is a protein that contains iron. And when it's measured in the blood, 
that's to assess whether you have too little or too much iron. Now, where this has been spun by the spin doctors is that it's not an accurate measure of iron deficiency. And the reason for that is because it's what's called an acute phase reactant, which means that it responds to inflammation. So somebody with high C-reactive protein, high alpha-1 acid glycoprotein called AGP levels, high interleukin-6, yeah, serum ferritin will be artificially elevated, and so it can't be relied upon as a standalone marker of iron status. But going back to that book I mentioned by Robert Crichton, he says, quote, the tissue iron load can be estimated by determining serum ferritin levels by chemical analysis of liver iron or by measuring liver iron and cardiac iron by non-invasive methods. A point that is commonly made in this iron overload group is that the iron isn't in the blood, it's stored in the tissues. And the only way to determine that, how bad the situation is, is with a full iron panel. And while it is helpful to look at transferrin saturation, serum iron, all of the different markers related to iron metabolism, of course, more data is great. But when they say that, and in the same breath, say that serum ferritin is an inaccurate marker of tissue iron stores, that is just flat out false. According to the very man that they quote so much, and I'll give some other quotes here, liver iron is often considered the gold standard for estimating body iron stores and has been shown to correlate with total body iron stores. That's a study from Angelucci et al. 2002. The liver accounts for approximately 70 to 80 percent of the total body iron stored in iron overloaded patients. So important to note, he's not saying that 80 percent of the iron is stored in the tissues throughout the body, nor does he say that ferritin should be called erotin because it's a useless marker. Now I believe that the acute phase reactant properties of ferritin is a smoke and mirrors thing. It's to get you to ignore these facts, and they are facts that Robert Crichton shares, like this one. He says, the distinction between anemia of chronic disease and iron deficiency anemia is difficult because an increased serum ferritin in itself does not exclude iron deficiency anemia in the presence of inflammation. So what is he saying in English? When there's inflammation and serum ferritin is elevated from the dean of iron biology of planet Earth, Robert Crichton, he's clearly saying that even in that situation, it doesn't exclude that the person could be iron deficient. And the severe grade of iron deficiency, which the iron overload people don't talk about there being levels to this, they kind of paint it as a blanket, black and white, you're either iron deficient or you're not. No, there are several levels where iron deficiency anemia, that anemia part, is the final stage. And I'm going to break down the stages right now. During the first stage of latent iron deficiency, during which all iron stored will be mobilized, there is evidence of iron deficiency without anemia. That is, the hemoglobin levels remain normal. The citation there is Butler and Wallen. That's two A's, W-A-A-L-E-N, 2006. This may be diagnostically silent, as the laboratory parameters will remain within normal limits although serum ferritin concentration and bone marrow iron stores, ferritin and hemosiderin, will gradually be decreased. Due to a higher need for hemoglobin production, iron absorption may already be increased, and signs of functional iron deficiency may be observed. 
Second phase, iron deficient erythropoiesis corresponds to exhaustion of the iron stores such that a lack of iron limits the production of hemoglobin and other iron containing proteins. The hemoglobin concentration is still normal since changes are insufficient for detection by standard clinical methods. However, other diagnostic criteria for iron deficiency are now easily recognizable, namely decreased serum ferritin, low serum iron, high serum transferrin, and as a result, decreased transferrin saturation, and increased plasma levels of soluble transferrin receptor. That's by Mast et al., 1998, and Skykne et al., 1990. That's S-K-I-K-N-E. Now the third stage, iron deficiency anemia, the hemoglobin concentration decreases. Initially, the mean corpuscular volume, MCV, and mean corpuscular hemoglobin, MCH, are still normal. In the chronic phase, with a further decrease of hemoglobin, the MCV and MCH can become very low, together with the appearance of pathological erythroblasts in the bone marrow and a pathological morphology of red cells in the peripheral blood. End quote, Robert Crichton. So in English, to break all of that down, it's that hemoglobin doesn't decrease until the third stage, where we call iron deficiency anemia. The first phase and the second phase, where so many people are being told by practitioners now to go and donate blood when their hemoglobin looks normal but they're actually in a state of iron deficiency. I believe that's what happened with my second blood donation. I was iron deficient. My hemoglobin was normal, so they let me donate blood. And I believe that pushed me further. I suspect I was already in the first or second phase due to being mostly plant-based for the first 30 years of my life into that potentially third stage of iron deficiency anemia, judging by my extreme fatigue. Another part in the book, quote, the single best measure to assess iron stores non-invasively is the serum ferrin concentration. Another quote from Robert Crichton, in normal human subjects, some 25% of total body iron, 800 to 1,000 milligrams, is present in the storage forms, mostly as ferritin. Last quote, which I found interesting. A serum ferritin value below 10 to 15 grams per liter is diagnostic of virtual absence of iron stores. The only known conditions that lower the serum ferritin concentration independently of iron deficiency are hypothyroidism and vitamin C deficiency. But these conditions rarely cause problems in the clinical diagnosis. This is the final quote I'll share from Robert Crichton, and these should be bombshells if you're in or have been in the iron overload cult. Quote, the key factor in iron metabolism is that we only absorb one to two milligrams per day and can eliminate one to two milligrams per day. So we walk a tight rope, absorb too much, and we become iron loaded, too little and we become anemic. As you can see, this topic is so nuanced, and a lot of the facts that I just shared are ignored, censored, and suppressed. And I know because I was sharing these last year, and people did not want to hear it because they spent a lot of money to get a certification with a certain protocol and then they learn that a lot of it was half-truths, and so they feel cheated. It's like people that got their college degree, and they're not making money off of that degree, and they're in debt several thousands of dollars. And then to further the pain, a lot of what they were taught was just incorrect. That's a hard pill to swallow. and. Like Neo in the Matrix, they will resist it. It will cause nausea and they won't want to believe the truth. 
And that's what I've seen with this whole subject of iron. What it is, is people choosing credibility over helping people. And it's really sad because people are getting hurt, especially women with this information. And when I realized that I was wrong, I immediately put out content countering it with a point of view that was really censored. So last September, September of 2022, I interviewed Caitlin Hardigan that created the Iron Protocol. And she's seen hundreds of people that were damaged from the advice of these practitioners saying to donate blood when they were actually iron deficient. And as I mentioned, with those phases of iron deficiency, they had no clue because their iron overload guru didn't tell them that there are these three stages of iron deficiency and anemia is only one of them. So if your head is spinning with a lot of this information, highly recommend going to my YouTube channel. That's where a lot of the older podcasts are archived and search Mito Life Radio, Caitlin Hardigan, and listen to that show because I think it's broken down so eloquently and it might be easier to understand than all of these truth bombs that I'm throwing out there with the Robert Crichton quotes. But as a teaser, I can share some of the highlights from that show because I take notes every time I record a podcast so I can reference it later. And here are some of the notes from that show that ferritin lower than 30 is clinical absolute iron deficiency. I asked her about hereditary hemochromatosis, and she said that she's homozygous gene mutation for hereditary hemochromatosis, and she's been taking iron at that point for three years, now it'd be four years, and has had three transfusions. And she says 90% of people with hemochromatosis don't develop iron overload. She said that most people that are iron deficient are meat eaters. Going back to that heme versus non-heme iron, that's contrary to what you would imagine. She said anemia doesn't occur until 180 biochemical processes are dampened or shut down. And that anemia and iron deficiency are two different things. And that's a big thing that we highlighted in that show because that's a common misconception. Just because you're not anemic, it doesn't mean that you aren't iron deficient. Before I move on to the next topic, I want to share my experience with getting my highly sensitive C-reactive protein, often abbreviated HSCRP tested, which is a marker for inflammation throughout the body. And for years, I was hovering at a level around 10. And at the same time, I was tracking my ferritin. So going back to what I was talking about with ferritin being an acute phase reactant, that rises under inflammation. I was obviously inflamed because my HSCRP was at a 10 for seven years. And I believe that's because I neglected going to the dentist, which is another popular message. Some people go as far as to say we don't even need to <laughs> brush our teeth, which is really insane, or use toothpaste. So I stopped neglecting going to the dentist. I went and had a cleaning, took care of a few cavities that had been there for years and years, at least seven years. And my HSCRP fell from a 10 down to 0.5. And my ferritin went from 71 when I was at a 10 with HSCRP, 71, that is nanograms per milliliter, down to 64 once the inflammation was resolved. So that's a tiny drop of only seven nanograms per milliliter. And I imagine my ferritin to go down to the 20s based on what I had been taught for the last few years, that it rises dramatically under inflammation. That wasn't dramatic at all. That was such a small drop. And what I like about Caitlin's point of view in the iron protocol is in the show, we talked about ideal lab values. 
and where those come from. Because a lot of people glorify these lab tests and use them to organize their supplements and their lifestyle. But she was saying it's glorifying averages with outliers getting taken out. So it doesn't apply to everybody. And looking at my ferritin being 64, according to her protocol, that could be low based on how I feel. And judging by three decades of not eating a lot of red meat and zero shellfish or oysters or anything that would bump up my iron, uh, makes sense. And according to my gene mutations, I do have the H6-3D variant in the hemochromatosis uh, HFE gene, and yet my ferritin is relatively low. So a common theme that I'm going to talk about in this show is the fear that spread around these really essential nutrients, and I was a part of it fearing ascorbic acid, which is naturally found in fruit and vegetables, fearing zinc, and perhaps the most important metal, iron, which was referenced as just the dumb waiter that carries oxygen, when in fact, it's probably the most important mineral and metal in the human body. So first, I broke through the spell of whole food C is safer and more effective than ascorbic acid. And then shortly after that, I broke through the spell that everybody's iron overloaded and nobody's iron deficient. And I just kept going down the list. And I'm not going to talk about it in this show, but one of the latest fear things the last year is vitamin A overload or vitamin A toxicity. It's always these fear campaigns going back to looking for clicks and engagement to grow their business. Once I dropped the fear mentality and looked at nutrition from a more balanced perspective, immediately I had a stress reduction effect. I think a lot of people are stuck in this chronic state of being stressed because they're fearing this supplement and that supplement and this food and that food and oxalates and lectins and phytates and this supplement's toxic. And it's just really wild how that mentality is so popular. Last thing I'll say on the iron topic as it relates to deficiency, which doesn't get as much airtime as iron overload. Fluoroquinolones, chelate iron, not just the popular copper and magnesium, but they also chelate iron. A lot of people have taken fluoroquinolones. I had a show on that about getting floxed and the damage that that causes. I talked to a guy recently here in Idaho that had chronic stomach ulcers. And from what I understand, that's a really common issue that I hear about. And that depletes iron. So we're talking about bleeding in the stomach and intestines. That's not just a woman issue. Men bleed too, even though they're not in battle. We have all of these things causing it. One of the first subjects I got into when I started studying human health was parasites, parasitic infection. And I plan to have a whole show on that, but that's a huge cause of iron deficiency, 700 million people have hookworm. Even before I started this podcast, one of the mantras that I memorized was that there's no physiological mechanism to get rid of excess iron except for menstrual bleeding in women. And that couldn't be further from the truth. There's a huge laundry list of causes that can cause iron deficiency in both men and women. I'll wrap this up by saying that the iron overload information is not completely useless. If someone truly has excess iron and iron overload, then this information is great and blood donation is great. But 
what I'm highlighting in this episode is that to say that everybody needs to donate and everybody has excess iron, that's actually dangerous advice and potentially deadly advice to men and women that are iron deficient. So now switching gears to vitamin C, the topic is whole food vitamin C versus ascorbic acid. And the messaging goes, whole food vitamin C is safer and it is more effective than ascorbic acid. And furthermore, the messaging goes that ascorbic acid is harmful and it depletes copper and screws up ceruloplasmin, which ceruloplasmin is a protein made in the liver that carries copper throughout the body. What I didn't learn about is that high ceruloplasmin levels play a role in the development of schizophrenia by exacerbating dopaminergic dysregulation. It's also involved in OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and other mental neurodegenerative issues. And on the topic of schizophrenia, I found a really interesting article called Vitamin Therapy in Schizophrenia by Leonard John Hoffer, MD, PhD. And it reads, ascorbic acid deficiency is well known in chronic schizophrenia and regrettably is not a relic of the past, having been observed in approximately one third of the patients in a modern British mental hospital. This high prevalence of ascorbic acid deficiency is not surprising for people with schizophrenia commonly forego fresh fruits and vegetables in favor of cigarette smoking, a practice which increases the ascorbic acid requirement. It goes on to say, the acute phase metabolic response to an inflammatory disease increases metabolic clearance of ascorbic acid and reduces its plasma concentration, sometimes to undetectable levels. So having broke the spell that I was under with all these different belief systems about all these vital nutrients, it made me revisit orthomolecular medicine and the groundbreaking work that was done by Abram Hoffer, Linus Pauling, and other legends that used megavitamin therapy to see dramatic, sometimes immediate turnarounds in a lot of neurological disorders, but all sorts of chronic conditions. I'd imagine that supplementing ascorbic acid improves schizophrenia because it's affecting ceruloplasmin. So it's actually a good thing. So the subject of whole food supplements versus isolated supplements has been a heated topic for decades. It's nothing new. You have entire supplement companies that build their customer base around that philosophy. And once they commit to it, especially for several decades, there's no going back even if the founder or people on the team learn otherwise. But going back to orthomolecular medicine and Abram Hoffer using megadoses of vitamin B3 in different forms, niacin, niacinamide, getting incredible results. The Rorden Clinic, Linus Pauling using ascorbic acid, isolated, and getting miraculous results for cancer and various diseases. All the other B vitamins, especially B1 or thiamine, listen to my show that I did with Elliot Overton. He has a company where he sells various forms of vitamin B1 and does lectures around the world talking about mega vitamin therapy using thiamine, and he's seeing miraculous turnarounds for neurological conditions, all sorts of things, just with taking a ton, supraphysiological doses, enormous doses of vitamin B1 in isolation, synthetic. This isn't food-based. And we can go on and on down the list. Chole calciferol, 
alpha tocopherol or mixed tocopherols. Vitamin K2 is MK4 or MK7. Even retinol palmitate, vitamin A that's isolated. Miraculous results for certain diseases, taking megadoses of it. And then you have these blog posts about ascorbic acid being poison. And they often say that it's derived from GMO cornstarch, genetically modified corn sugar, rice starch, or my favorite, they say it's derived from black mold, which I don't know who started that wild idea. I could say that mitolife ascorbic acid is derived from non-GMO cornstarch. So where these companies that use it in their marketing try to paint that 99% or 99.9% of ascorbic acid on the market is derived from GMO cornstarch, that's simply a lie. Yeah, maybe your Walmart brands or CVS or some big box store where it's super cheap. Yeah, it's probably derived from that because to be that cheap, it has to be derived from something that doesn't cost a lot. But to say that it's all of it or most of it, that's just flat out a lie. And these companies use it to sell their whole food vitamin C product. And full disclosure, as of recording this show, I still have a whole food C product because I came out with it because I believed in it at the time. And I still believe it's beneficial just as eating an apple or an orange or a mango is beneficial. There are a lot of compounds in there that support human health. But to say that you can get the same results from less ascorbic acid, which is really the ingredient doing the work in quote whole food vitamin C, as the studies that were done by the Rorden Clinic and Linus Pauling, that's just absolutely incorrect. And they'll often show this cartoon that was made up that shows the whole food C complex. And in the center, there's tyrosinase and copper. And then around that, there's K factors and P factors and J factors. And then one shell further out, there's ascorbogen and bioflavonoid complexes. And then the outer shell, which is the thinnest layer, is ascorbic acid. And they're trying to make the point with this Mickey Mouse cartoon that ascorbic acid is the smallest part of this complex and that it is not the star of the show and that for it to work and to be safe, it needs all of these other nutrients with it. And here's a quote from a website that markets whole food vitamin C. It reads, ascorbic acid does not have the critical enzyme tyrosinase, a copper containing enzyme. This is what makes whole food vitamin C complex so therapeutic. Well, if that's true, then what about all these thousands of studies that used ascorbic acid in isolation without tyrosinase and saw huge benefits and reversals in disease states? There's over 60,000 clinical studies on vitamin C, and they're using ascorbic acid. They're not using this fairy tale whole food vitamin C complex. So if they don't have you convinced with all the stuff I just talked about, then there's the scary processing of ascorbic acid. As the owner of Mitolife, a supplement company, I can say that the processes are standardized. It's not like the Wild West where you can cook up vitamin C in a dark alley or in your basement and then have a supplement company and pawn that off as a supplement. As I said before, there are definitely cheaper grades and cheaper companies that market to people that are really on a shoestring budget and are buying cheap supplements filled with fillers and excipients. But as far as sketchy practices in the industry, there are what's called FDA audits. And they don't give a heads up. They don't send an email that they're on their way. They just show up randomly, knock on the door of a facility, and then for several days, walk around scrutinizing with a fine-tooth comb 
how that contract manufacturer is operating, encapsulating the product, storing the product, transporting the product, the whole process is looked at under a microscope. And a lot of people don't know that. And that's where you could fall for these blogs where they make the processing sound super scary and sketchy when in fact it's all regulated and tightly controlled. If you want to dive deeper into this topic, uh, check out my episode from seven months ago. It's titled, Is Whole Food Vitamin C Better Than Ascorbic Acid? It's episode 196. Instead of going to blog posts, I suggest you guys go over to PubMed and type in ascorbic acid and look at all the research that's been done on its benefits. I have a study here from 2007. It's called Effect of Vitamin C on Blood Glucose, Serum Lipids, and Serum Insulin in Type 2 Diabetic Patients. The study had 84 patients in Iran use either 500 milligrams of ascorbic acid or 1,000 milligrams. And it's interesting, they found that the lower dose, which by some would be considered a normal dose or maybe even a high dose, the 500 milligrams did not produce any significant change in their LDL, their hemoglobin A1C, their serum insulin, their fasting blood glucose. But when they took enough, the 1,000 milligram dose for six weeks, they saw a significant reduction in all of those markers. One of the light bulbs came on for me when I started thinking about chlorinated pools. And I grew up with one of those old school above ground chlorinated pools with the little duck floating around, spreading chlorine throughout the water. And I was dosed on that significantly for my entire childhood, at least the first 20 years of my life. I was dosing probably daily with chlorine, and that's a known toxin. Breathing chlorine gas, like in a jacuzzi that I spent a lot of time in growing up, that's corrosive to mucous membranes. It's a pulmonary irritant that causes damage in the upper and lower respiratory tract. Chlorine is in the halogen family along with fluorine, bromine, and iodine. I find it fascinating that Fluoride gets the spotlight where we often forget about chlorine. Chlorine will deplete a lot of nutrients. It'll actually displace iodine and lead to low thyroid hormone levels, but it'll also deplete vitamin C. And you can use vitamin C to neutralize chlorine. It's about two and a half parts ascorbic acid to one part chlorine. And smart swimmers that swim in chlorinated pools will put ascorbic acid in a spray bottle, shake it up, and after swimming in chlorinated water all day, they'll spray their body with it. Chlorine also depletes vitamin E. There's a 1989 study from Bertrand called Effects of Chlorine and Fluorine on Vitamin E, the Human Body, and the Environment. So you can keep going down the list of all of these nutrients that chlorine depletes. And I think it's really overlooked and specifically the connection between vitamin C, aka ascorbic acid, and chlorine is overlooked. I know it wasn't just me that was raised in chlorinated pools because I went in them with all my friends and they had the same exposure and they were also depleting these antioxidants, vitamin C and vitamin E. And then you add in all of these environmental stressors and stressors in our food and water supply, tons of refined sugar consumed with polyunsaturated fatty acids with almost every meal, just tons of oxidative stress constantly. And we take away our two big defenses, ascorbic acid, or you can say more specifically tissue ascorbate and vitamin E. And there's a relationship between those two nutrients because vitamin C regenerates vitamin E after vitamin E donates its electron. And that process is called redox recycling. 
the last thing I would like to address on the topic of vitamin C is the elephant in the room known as oxalates, more specifically kidney stones, often calcium oxalate stones. Oxalic acid is found in a lot of different foods, nuts, beets, chocolate, coffee, tea, spinach, and we actually make oxalates endogenously every day. And that production ranges from 10 to 25 milligrams a day. I really think this topic is overblown and sensationalized. There's no doubt that certain people should not high dose ascorbic acid Linus Pauling style because of genetics. And that specific genetic variant I'm referencing is CLD. N14. That gene is expressed in the part of the kidney where water and salts are reabsorbed into the blood, and it helps with calcium transport. And a variant in that gene is associated with increased urine calcium levels and reduced bone mineral density, and ultimately an increased risk of kidney stones. And I actually have the variant of that gene. It's called RS. 219779, and I'm GG, which increases my genetic predisposition to kidney stones. That said, I still consume ascorbic acid because the research is mixed. There were two large prospective cohort studies, one looking at 45,251 men for six years, and the other one looking at 85,557 women for 14 years. And they reported that consumption of greater than or equal to 1,500 milligrams, so 1.5 grams of ascorbic acid daily, did not increase the risk of kidney stone formation compared to those consuming less than 250 milligrams daily. And I will link those two studies in the show notes, ones from Kurhan called a prospective study of the intakes of vitamin C and B6 and the risk of kidney stones in men. The other one is also Kurhan intake of vitamins B6 and C and the risk of kidney stones in women. And other sh studies show the opposite. Vitamin C increases the risk of calcium oxalate stones. I think the reason why there are so many conflicting studies on this subject is very simply, genetic mutations and everyone being different with their mutations. Because one person's had a really negative experience supplementing vitamin C or megadosing vitamin C, they very often, because it's an emotional experience, will scream from the mountaintops that nobody should ever take high dose vitamin C because they had kidney stones formed from it. But it doesn't mean that someone else will have that same experience because we're all different genetically. The conventional recommendations to reduce your risk of developing kidney stones is to drink plenty of water because if you don't, the minerals will settle and bond in the kidneys and urinary tract. And it's interesting now looking at a lot of these trends in the natural health communities. And one of the biggest ones I've seen lately is don't drink plain water, that we should always have minerals in our water, we should always be drinking mineral rich water. And some people say we should never drink water at all. We should only drink milk and coffee and bone broth and fruit and vegetable juice, which is simply insane. And I think those recommendations might be a big reason why a lot of people are having oxalate kidney stone issues. Other common recommendations include reducing sodium intake and red meat intake, and also pairing calcium-rich foods with oxalate-rich foods. Because a misconception is because called calcium oxalate crystals that you should reduce your calcium intake, but a diet low in calcium actually increases the risk of developing kidney stones. And calcium oxalate stones are not the only type 
There's also uric acid stones and various others. I'd like to have a whole podcast dedicated to kidney stones and maybe talk about the Andreas Moritz liver flushes in the amazing liver and gallbladder flush book that he wrote. Moving on to the next topic. I don't think I meant for this episode to be this extensive on each subject. EMFs, EMR, electromagnetic fields, electromagnetic radiation, and the whole idea of blocking them. I've experimented quite extensively for the past 14 years inside the home and outside the home at, say, hotel rooms with various different mitigation techniques and combinations, not taking anyone's word as gospel and believing it, but actually going out there and experimenting and trying it out for myself. For the whole year of 2020 and 2021, I would only fly in airplanes wearing conductive silver clothing. And granted, this was actually touching my skin, which makes it worse. And there are a lot of companies out there selling not only shirts and jackets and joggers, even socks and gloves. Usually it's a baseball cap and the inside of the hat is coated with a silver fabric material. And the idea, and it makes sense on paper, is that it's a floating ground. And so waves that are traveling will interact with the silver And instead of going, say, through your brain, it will go around it in the shape of the baseball cap, thus causing less oxidative stress to your neurons and ultimately protecting your brain. And that was my belief for several years. One day I sat down for a burger with my friend Brian Hoyer, who is an EMF expert, and He was not a fan of EMF blocking clothing, and he explained to me why. He said, because when the EMFs interact with that silver fabric, there's a secondary harmonic frequency that's generated, and we don't know what those frequencies are or their effects on our biology. So he planted that seed in my mind, and that was so counter to what I believed but it eventually sprouted and it made sense. And I stopped wearing those clothes when I was out. I started to think about it. Why would I want to be attracting EMFs by wearing metal on my body? I don't even wear a ring, a necklace, a metal watch. So why would I cover my body head to toe in this EMF attracting material? It just stopped making sense to me. And it really crescendoed when I put a ton of money into a sensory deprivation flotation room at home. So you guys might be familiar with this sensory deprivation pods. You can go to a spa and they look like little round oval spaceships. You open the hatch, you get in there either nude or with a swimsuit and you lay down on your back, and you're floating in 1,200 pounds roughly of magnesium sulfate that's warmed up to nearly body temperature, and there's no sound, no light, and you're absolutely weightless, and it's had a lot of health benefits, especially people with chronic stress and PTSD and other issues. So I built one of these at the house, but I made the catastrophic mistake of using the Y-Shield EMF blocking paint. The product is called Max 54. And what it does is it shields or blocks high frequency and low frequency electric fields up to 100 decibels at 40 gigahertz. So in that room, you can't use your cell phone because you can't get a signal. And in fact, I've had someone bring their phone into that shielded room 
and I immediately felt a shooting pain in my leg because the door was open. So I think signal was coming in and then just ricocheting around. So it's kind of a dangerous situation. And the reason why I'm going to tear down that room eventually is because I get anxiety when I'm in there for too long. Even if we're not physically touching the earth and grounding skin to earth, we're still getting exposed to the electromagnetic field of the earth. And in that room, I believe I'm not getting any of that. And it makes me think back to an interview I had with Dean Bonley, the creator of the Magnetico sleep pad. And he talked about that experiment where they put two people in a completely shielded room. So they weren't getting any of the earth's natural fields. And within minutes, they felt like they were falling apart and they got very emotional and started crying. And one of the participants felt that they were going to die if they weren't taken out of there. And I had a really smart EMF expert on Sean Cranish, and he was telling me how to properly EMF shield a school. And he was saying, just paint one wall. So I'm not completely throwing out the whole subject of shielding. I think it could absolutely be done. And I think it's smart to do if you have a laptop on your lap to put one of these products in between your skin and the laptop. But when it comes to wearing silver clothing and completely EMF shielding an entire room, I don't think that's healthy or safe. I can say from my experience flying on airplanes, not wearing shielded clothing, I feel less disoriented. Back when I used to wear the jogger and the jacket and the full outfit to block my organs from getting hit from man made EMFs, I would always feel just a little out of it when traveling for an entire day wearing that clothing. And now, not wearing any of that, I could say that I feel better, just more mentally stable when I land in my destination. I've talked about it a lot on the show before. I would use nutritional supplements as the first line of defense from electromagnetic fields, namely ascorbic acid, also known as vitamin C, vitamin E, and even zinc. That is an unsung hero for EMF mitigation. There's a fascinating study from 2006. It's called Zinc Supplementation Ameliorates Electromagnetic Field Induced Lipid Peroxidation in the Rat Brain. So they used three milligrams per kilogram per day of the zinc sulfate form. For me, that equates to a little under 200 milligrams of zinc every day. And they found that the rats that didn't consume zinc, had lower glutathione levels. And they also looked at T-bars levels, which is a sign of lipid peroxidation. And those levels were significantly lower in the zinc supplemented group. There's a bunch of other studies. Just search zinc electromagnetic fields. There's a really cool study that's called Effects of Electromagnetic Fields Exposure on the Antioxidant Defense System. It's a 2017 study, and they go into a lot of the different nutrients that are taxed in the presence of EMFs. And that study brings a lot of the different studies all together to talk about vitamin E and how that protects against the harmful effects of EMFs and even vitamin B9, folic acid, folate and how that prevents reductions in cell numbers in the cerebellum and the brain. It also delves into melatonin and how that exhibits a protective effect against EMF-induced oxidative stress, reducing neuronal damage in the hippocampus, even protecting the kidneys from negative effects of EMFs, 
I think it's common knowledge now that magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker, which is one of the numerous effects that EMF causes by opening up the voltage gated calcium channels. It also mentions vitamin A, of which I'm a huge fan, and that protects cellular membranes from oxidative stress. My favorite source of that is Rosita cod liver oil. The study also mentions selenium. There's a huge list of nutrients that help protect us against EMFs. That's the best place to start. So vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin A, magnesium, zinc, selenium. I would start there before trying to block EMFs. So the next health trend I wish I never got into is cod liver oil being toxic. I used to put cod liver oil in the same category as fish oil because of the polyunsaturated fatty acid, otherwise known as PUFA content. And there are studies looking at a high intake of polyunsaturated fatty acids, different metals like aluminum or iron and oestrogen coming together to form these age spots. But I dove deeper into it and found that vitamin A actually protects against lipofuscin accumulation, just like vitamin E does. And vitamin A is built into cod liver oil. So there's a big difference between someone supplementing fish oil with a vitamin A deficiency and a vitamin E deficiency versus someone taking cod liver oil and a high quality vitamin E supplement that contains mixed tocopherols. I was hesitant to supplement cod liver oil for years. And then I experienced a really cold winter where I just wasn't adapting. I felt like the cold was super harsh. So I experimented with supplementing cod liver oil because I read that the Vikings used it to withstand and thrive in really harsh winters. So when I experiment, I experiment and I started slugging it back straight from the bottle, the Rosita liquid cod liver oil. And within one to two weeks, I felt warmer. Could it actually increase my metabolism, which is exactly contrary to what a lot of people were saying that polyunsaturated fatty acids in the cod liver oil were going to lower the metabolic rate and thus make you colder. It actually did the exact opposite. It made my body a whole lot warmer. And that could be because of vitamin A or retinol and that connection with thyroid hormone metabolism. Just search thyroid vitamin A on PubMed and you'll see all of these studies that come up, the relationship between thyroid disorders and vitamin A deficiency. It's needed for the activation of thyroid hormone receptors. And if you're one of the people that is a poor converter of plant-based vitamin A, like beta carotene, which I consumed a lot of growing up and in my vegan days, to provitamin A, to real vitamin A, then you're going to be deficient. And judging by a childhood with a lot of acne and eczema and rashes and all sorts of skin issues, what do they give people with those issues? Synthetic vitamin A, it's called. It's a retinoid medication for cystic acne. But if I just would have taken cod liver oil while I was growing up, then not only would my skin have been clearer, but I would have had healthier organs and healthier mitochondria. So from 2020 through 2021, what I noticed is I was in an echo chamber online with the health community and everyone was just saying the same thing. And when I decided to break out of it and experiment and learn through my own experience what the truth was, it was the exact opposite of what everyone else was saying, that cod liver oil was going to lower my metabolism or cause vitamin A toxicity or whatever people are saying in the health space. 
I decided to just ignore all of that and just try it. And I always encourage you guys to do the same thing. Don't get scared into not trying something. Because all the time I'll read these scare articles about various supplements. And then I hear or talk to someone firsthand that their life actually completely turned around for the better by taking that exact, quote, toxic supplement. I think currently the big ones getting demonized are vitamin B6 and iron. So lipid peroxidation is the process where free radical oxidation occurs with polyunsaturated fatty acids like linolenic acid or arachidonic acid. And malondialdehyde or MDA is one of the final products that's created from PUFA polyunsaturated fatty acid peroxidation. And I found a really fascinating study where they gave rats both vitamin E and cod liver oil, and they actually showed a significant decrease in the MDA levels, that marker of lipid peroxidation, an increase in superoxide dismutase, catalase, and glutathione, which are the big antioxidants that the body produces. So I kept finding studies like that. And it really showed me that it's really a balance between those fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And I think the vitamin E is often overlooked, especially if someone's supplementing something that contains a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acid content. You definitely want to balance that out with vitamin E. In the 1880s, cod liver oil was discovered to be effective in curing both night blindness and corneal lesions. So if you or someone you know has eye issues, if you can't see well at night, that is a pretty clear sign that you're vitamin A deficient and cod liver oil can likely help. If you or someone you know has skin issues, like I was raised with really annoying chronic acne, that's usually a vitamin A and vitamin E deficiency. So a great place to start is consuming cod liver oil and vitamin E and seeing if that clears up your skin. How it works is through retinoids, which are the various molecules that are derived from vitamin A. So retinol is converted to retinaldehyde, and then that's converted to retinoic acid, which are found in a lot of skin products. But you can do it internally with your supplements from the inside out and support gene expression and cellular processes in the epidermis and dermis. And what's really fascinating is when you start diving into the connection between vitamin A and sunlight, and specifically the ultraviolet radiation, UV light actually depletes cellular retinol. And vitamin A has a photoprotective effect in the skin by absorbing ultraviolet B radiation. So vitamin A and vitamin E are great internal sunscreens. And whenever I'm traveling, especially at an airport, great place to people watch, I'll just count the age spots on people and look at all the lipofuscin. And a lot of these people go on vacations in Hawaii or some tropical vacation and get a nice suntan. But the result of that, especially when combined with no supplementation or minimal supplementation or wrong supplementation like fish oil, sands, vitamin E, then you get age spots and you could see it usually on the forearms and the forehead. And usually that's accompanied by baldness in men. So if I were exposing my skin to that much ultraviolet radiation from the sun that frequently, I would definitely consume cod liver oil, vitamin E, and also some ascorbic acid, which also protects from photo damage. My favorite brand of cod liver oil is definitely from Rosita. I've tried all their products. They're all great. Even the ratfish liver oil tincture. They sell the cod liver oil in two different forms, liquid in a small bottle or capsules. The capsules are great if you're traveling 
or if you're really sensitive to that burning sensation, because there's a little bit of rosemary that they use as a preservative. For some reason, I find in the winter, it's easier to handle that burning sensation from the liquid, maybe because my body's just craving it more and it's easier to higher dose it from the bottle versus the capsules. If you want to dive more into cod liver oil, I recommend going to Rosita USA, click their learn tab and then history. And that's a really great breakdown. Actually, the best I've read on cod liver oil, starting with the Viking era in the late 700s. Like liver, cod liver oil is another one of those ancestral foods that's been consumed for a really long time. One thing I forgot to mention is the relationship between vitamin A and cold exposure. I'd mentioned that the Vikings have used cod liver oil for harsh winters. And one of the mechanisms might be the redistribution of vitamin A out of the liver. There's a really interesting study from the Medical University of Vienna. They demonstrated that moderate application of cold increased the levels of vitamin A and retinol binding protein in both humans and mice. So most of the vitamin A stores are in the liver and cold exposure stimulates the redistribution of vitamin A out of the liver towards the adipose tissue. And a lot of people practice cold thermogenesis, ice baths, cold plunges, because that induces the conversion of white fat into brown fat. So brown adipose tissue, as opposed to white adipose tissue, has a higher concentration of mitochondria. And there's been several studies looking at brown adipose tissue being correlated with lower risk of type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, congestive heart failure, and hypotension. So people with more brown fat tend to have better metabolic health, improved glucose and lipid homeostasis. And it also keeps us warm in the cold. So a combination you might want to try if you're really intolerant to cold temperatures, you can try supplementing something like Rosita cod liver oil and getting some cold exposure, which doesn't necessarily mean breaking the ice in a lake and dunking in there for five or 10 minutes. It could be as simple as wearing less layers and going outside in a snowy winter and getting exposed there. That's what I did with the cod liver oil. I wasn't doing cold plunges and I still had a tremendous increase in my tolerance to the cold. So the next trend is regarding copper and the mantra is that almost everyone is copper deficient. It's been said that we live in a copper desert. It's very difficult to get in our diet and that's tied with we should never supplement zinc because it will increase metallothionine production which binds copper a thousand times stronger than zinc. And this subject is intimately tied with the iron overload subject. And that's because the ferrooxidase protein ceruloplasmin plays a part in regulating iron metabolism. And in that school of thought, anything that can potentially disrupt ceruloplasmin, ascorbic acid, or zinc should be avoided like the plague. And I lived this philosophy for two years. I didn't supplement any zinc or ascorbic acid. And the end result of that is that I got a pretty bad case of COVID. With everything that I do, I should have bounced back in a few days. But instead, it took me about a week. And I was really down and out and couldn't really function. So for the past year, I've been diving into the literature on the benefits of ascorbic acid and the benefits of zinc and bringing people on the podcast, HTMA practitioners, hair tissue mineral analysis. I finally did my first one and saw, like most people, I had a inverted 
zinc to copper ratio. And so talking to really smart experts in that field, Clark Engelbert first, and then more recently, Robert Selig, that have worked with a lot of clients and have firsthand experience helping people heal from copper overload or copper toxicity, it all started to make sense for me. And one thing I kept thinking about is I grew up not really enjoying meat. If I ate meat, it was like chicken nuggets from McDonald's. I didn't eat a lot of even burgers. I just didn't care for red meat. So it's safe to say for the first three decades of my life, I wasn't eating much red meat at all. And what is red meat a main source of? Zinc. I ate zero oysters for the first 30 years or so of my life. So I wasn't getting zinc there either or beef liver. And then I look at the copper intake and from a mostly vegetarian, then vegan and raw vegan diet, I was probably getting loaded with copper. And then I started to look at the symptoms related to copper toxicity. And it's a huge list, acne, fatigue, insomnia, anxiety. A lot of these things I've dealt with off and on. And if you actually go to drlwilson.com, he has a really great write-up, a lot of good articles actually, but the articles on copper and copper imbalance are a really good read. I find the ceruloplasmin worship thing really interesting. It's been called the God particle by some people, but when you search on PubMed, elevated ceruloplasmin, you'll see a list of all the different disease states associated with high ceruloplasmin levels, metabolic syndrome, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, Hodgkin's disease, even brain tumors, gastrointestinal tumors, and lung cancer. I was experimenting for a very short time period, supplementing liquid copper sulfate that I mixed at home into a tincture bottle. I was also experimenting with various encapsulated products, copper bisglycinate, copper niacin, and I felt good initially. I don't know if it was placebo or it was just making a change and you'll feel good regardless, but I noticed shortly thereafter my mental functioning decreased where I was more forgetful and I had a much harder time concentrating. And so I started supplementing zinc and I noticed a lot of those symptoms went away. So with hair tissue mineral analysis practitioners, they often talk about mineral balancing. And even if someone is copper toxic, they will still supplement them with copper. It's just a very minor amount, like two milligrams a day, but increase the zinc quite a bit more than that, where maybe they're taking 30 milligrams a day. What I decided to do is stop all supplemental copper and increase my zinc in the form of zinc carnosine, which I sell now under MitoLife. And that's one of the forms that never gives me nausea. I've taken other forms of zinc, zinc citrate, and I noticed that they kind of give me an upset stomach. I never get that effect from zinc carnosine, even taking it on an empty stomach. And now that I'm supplementing zinc and ascorbic acid, even small amounts of ascorbic acid, I do feel that my immune system is more resilient. If I feel like I'm coming down with something, it passes overnight and I'll wake up the next morning feeling great. Where in the past, when I was against ascorbic acid and zinc, it would take me so much longer to recover. I'm going to share some interesting copper quotes that I have in my notes that I've accumulated since November of 2022. With each successive generation, copper toxicity becomes more pervasive and common. Until medical doctors and other healthcare practitioners begin to study the mind-body's mineral system, especially as reflected in hair tissue mineral analysis, the medical and mineral disconnect will remain. 
Without HTMA data, medical doctors will not recognize the epidemic nature of the copper toxicity problem. That's Dr. Malter, PhD. Here's another one. A copper level exceeding 2.5 milligrams per 100 grams of hair is considered elevated. In the absence of external contamination, such as would result from daily swimming in pools or daily work in a copper mine, elevated hair copper has been proven to be a clinically meaningful screening test for copper toxicity. Here's one by Dr. Lawrence Wilson. In our experience, HTMA is the best method to detect copper imbalances. The hair mineral test can detect not only copper excess and copper deficiency, but copper biounavailability too. Hair is not a primary site of copper deposition. However, if one knows how to interpret the hair analysis, one can often rapidly and non-invasively assess copper status. For those that are not familiar, I've been mentioning HTMA, hair tissue mineral analysis, quite a bit. What that entails is you take a clipping of hair and basically you're sent a little piece of paper that you fold and put on the table and you put just enough hair where it tips the scale and you have enough hair to send into the lab. You mail it in, they essentially burn the hair, it emits different frequencies and from that you get a report sent to you that looks at all of your macro minerals and trace minerals and the ratios between them. And from that, you can assess a lot about your hormonal status, which nutrients you're deficient in, which nutrients you have too much of. I love that it's non-invasive. There's no needles involved and it's a proven science. And the practitioners that use this with their clients among other tests, get tremendous results. Now, what I learned recently that blew my mind is the relationship between copper and bile, which is a fluid made by the liver and stored in the gallbladder. It helps break down fats so we can absorb fat-soluble vitamins. And it also binds to fat-soluble toxins and carries them out of the body into the toilet. So recently, when I had Robert Selig on the show, he got me excited about coffee enemas, which I used to do regularly, and I stopped because I thought that they were unnecessary. But now I know they're absolutely necessary, especially after finding this quote. Approximately 50% of copper is excreted in the bile, while the remaining half is excreted through other gastrointestinal secretions. As such, the gastrointestinal tract is the major regulator of copper homeostasis. It's Royer et al. 2023. So imagine demonizing zinc, which helps to counter copper, not doing coffee enemas while supplementing copper or even food sources of copper. And it's all just building up with nowhere to go. My friend Adam Marfioti, that owns the company Lifeblood, has got me interested in the liver and gallbladder flush, popularized by Andreas Moritz, that wrote a book with that title. And he talked quite a bit about bile and all of the different disease states that result from having insufficient bile. I'm going to read a few lines from Andreas Moritz's book. A healthy liver receives and filters three pints of blood per minute and produces 1 to 1.5 quarts of bile every day. This ensures that all the activities in the liver and in the rest of the body run smoothly and efficiently. Without sufficient bile, most commonly eaten foods remain undigested or partially digested. For example, to enable the small intestines to digest and absorb fat and calcium from the food you eat, the food must first combine with bile. When fat is not absorbed properly, it indicates that bile secretion is insufficient. The undigested fat remains in the intestinal tract. When undigested fat reaches the colon, along with other waste products, bacteria break down some of the fat into fatty acids or excrete it with the stool. Since fat is lighter than water, having fat in the stool may cause it to float. When fat is not absorbed, calcium is not absorbed either, leaving the blood in a deficit. 
the blood subsequently takes its extra calcium from the bones. Most bone density problems, like osteoporosis, actually arise from insufficient bile secretion and poor digestion of fats, rather than from not consuming enough calcium. So the reason I'm spending so much time on this bile piece about copper toxicity is I want to provide solutions. I could spend this whole segment just talking about the research on copper toxicity and all of the various symptoms that go along with it and why the symptoms occur. I think that's less helpful than just giving you solutions, especially solutions that I've been experimenting with for the latter half of this year and getting tremendous improvements in my health. Andreas that I just quoted, he focuses a lot on excreting stones with flushes and I haven't gone down that rabbit hole yet. But just this bile piece and the effect that doing frequent coffee enemas has on bile secretion is huge. If you suspect that you've been loading up on copper for most of your life, like myself, a lot of the nutrients that I've been talking about in this show that I used to demonize and that are still demonized have beneficial effects for diabetes and blood sugar regulation. A systematic review meta-analysis gave zinc supplements to 974 participants and found in less than 12 weeks, there was beneficial effects on fasting blood glucose, insulin resistance, and triglyceride levels. And if they kept up with supplementing zinc past the 12 weeks, the benefits expanded to improve their hemoglobin A1c, lowering total cholesterol and LDL levels. That's Pompano et al. 2021. And one of the major effects of having an inverted zinc to copper ratio where you have too much copper, too little zinc, is weight gain and an inability to lose weight. One study found that copper levels are higher in circulation as well as in the adipose tissue and liver of obese patients. So I think this zinc deficiency copper overload is often a missing piece for people that have a hard time losing weight. Some people might be listening to all of this and think that I want copper to be zero or that I'm implying that. I'm absolutely not. Copper's essential. It's a trace mineral involved in mitochondrial respiration, melanin production, wound healing, neurotransmitter synthesis. But the daily intake required is less than two milligrams a day, and that's very easy to get. The MitoLife beef liver that I sell, the desiccated beef liver, contains half a milligram of copper in a serving. So depending on your target goal for copper intake every day, that could get you halfway there or a third of the way there or even a quarter of the way there. And then you add in all the other foods that you're consuming throughout the day. And it's very easy to get two milligrams of copper. Now, zinc, on the other hand, a lot harder to get. One study I found from Lowe et al., 1962, said that every doubling of zinc intake increases serum zinc concentration by only 6%. So even with my zinc carnosine supplement, 16 milligrams in a capsule is a pretty good dose, and that's of elemental zinc. So it's zinc bound to the amino acid carnosine, and from that complex, 16 milligrams of it is actual zinc. The rest is the amino acid carnosine that has awesome anti-glycation effects and blood sugar supporting effects and neuroprotective effects and all of these things that that quote-unquote non-essential amino acid does. But I was underdosing my own product for a while. I was just taking one a day. And it wasn't until I upped my dose to actually taking three or four at a time that I actually started to notice the effects. The better digestion because we need zinc to make hydrochloric acid. And part of that could be carnosine's effects on protecting and healing the stomach lining. But the improved memory 
mood, my vision, skin health, all of these things that I started to notice improving only when I took more than the recommended serving of zinc every day. The recommended dietary allowance, the RDA for adults, is 11 milligrams a day for men and 8 milligrams for women. That's absolutely not enough to correct a lifetime of zinc deficiency. Now, I'm not saying that people should high dose zinc forever, but when you look at a lot of these studies, for example, this one looking at Swedish men and the risk of prostate cancer, 9 to 13 milligrams of zinc a day wasn't enough to lower the risk. But once they got up to 15 to 20 milligrams a day, then they saw a lower risk of prostate cancer mortality. But taking high dose over a prolonged period of time can increase the risk of prostate cancer. So I'm not saying that should mega dose nonstop. And that's where the HTMA test really comes in. They recommend every three to four months send in some hair and you could start to see your trend of your ratios and which direction you're going. Mega dosing is a really fascinating subject to me. And a lot of people know me as Mr. Megadose. And I get a lot of criticism for it. And the detractors say that there's never a useful case for megadosing. It's always dangerous. And they liken it to trying to take shortcuts with your health. They often say that slow and steady is a better way to heal. But if you have that belief system, you're contradicting decades of research that proves to the contrary that megadosing is harmful and or ineffective. There's the orthomolecular legends such as Abram Hoffer, Linus Pauling, Carl Pfeiffer. If you study their work, you'll see that they used megadoses with their patients and saw incredible, miraculous turnarounds. At some point, I should have a whole show just on megadosing alone because there's a lot with that subject to expand on. If you want to dive deeper into this, I recommend listening to my show, especially the first one with Clark Engelbert. We talked about copper quite a bit and also my show with Robert Selig, especially if you suspect that you have a copper and zinc in balance. I think it's really important to go and listen to those shows. As I've said before in previous solo shows, never be afraid to change your mind, even if the mob attacks you for it and you get ostracized from the cult, because helping other people and helping yourself is worth it. You never know who's on the fence that's stuck in these dogmatic ideas that I talked about in this show, and they're still dealing with chronic health conditions, and they're just pretending like they're not, and almost hiding them from people. The interesting thing about the natural health community is that everyone has a sales pitch. If they're not selling supplements, they're selling a coaching program, or if they're not selling that, they're just selling their ideas. And everyone pretends to have everything figured out and that you buy into their program. But the scary truth is that nobody has it figured out because every person has blind spots and people are absolutely confident of what they know until they get proven otherwise through their own experience their own humbling experience. And that's one of the main reasons why I'm staying public and not going underground and remaining some connection to the natural health community. As the Joker said in the dark night, it's not about money, it's about sending a message. And my message is that nobody has it figured out. You give me the smartest sounding, most articulate, 
guy using big words, rattling off studies off the top of his head. He'll still have blind spots and he'll still be dead wrong about several subjects. And yet people will follow that person. And if they say melatonin supplementation is bad, then the loyal listener will never take it and never experiment with it. And I really think that's a tragedy. We should always be experimenting and never follow anyone's program 100%. So there they are, the five health trends I wish I never got into. I will say, if you go back and listen to old episodes on this podcast, all of the topics that I just countered, you'll see me speaking in support of very passionately and enthusiastically. And I would say that there's truths in everything. And there are still truths in that information. Like there are still people on the planet that legitimately have hemochromatosis and iron overload. So that information can save their life. Or people with genetic defects and true copper deficiency. That information could be life changing. But when I scan the latest podcasts and see the topics that are trending, it's a lot of the stuff that I addressed. It's everyone's iron overloaded, everyone's copper deficient, whole food vitamin C is better than ascorbic acid. And I see all of these things as booby traps now to avoid because I've been on both sides of the argument and I know what the truth is. So if you want to check out my website, that's Matt hyphen blackburn.com you can read about my clf protocol which i think is one of the more gentle protocols out there even if you just took a few things on there and ran with it you would probably see some improvements in your health i'm a little behind with updating that this year so i'm going to work on that and add in new information that i've learned if you click on shop, you can see all of my recommended products. These are things that I've used over the years and or am using currently that have helped me improve my health. And if someone happens to notice, I have Faraday bags on there from the company SLNT. I don't recommend those necessarily for EMF protection but more for sensitive electronics, maybe you have a Bitcoin external wallet or you travel a lot and you don't want people stealing your information. Maybe you have electronics that you want to protect from a potential EMP, electromagnetic pulse or a coronal mass ejection or solar flare. These things are all improbable, but possible. And then if you want to check out the MitoLife products you can go to mitolife.co. Our seven stage under counter drinking water filter is selling really quickly. So we're working on restocking that, and that should be back within the next week. Some of the other products, including Dissolve It All and the shampoo, should also be back in stock soon. And I'm working on getting the vitamin E back in stock before Christmas. There are two new products I'm really excited about that should be released at the time of this podcast. If not, they'll be released by early next week. If you want to delve deeper into the stuff that I talk about, check out the MitoLife Academy on YouTube. It's $15 and you gain access to the past about three years of health content. So that's all. I have some exciting shows lined up to close out the year. See you guys next Friday. Stay supercharged.